Welcome back to Republic. Previously, we, uh... I'm not even sure where to begin, frankly. How about this? Daniel Marcus Zager, the pesky journalist revolutionary who the Prizrak triumphantly had declared dead, is in fact not dead, but alive. That's definitely something, right? Bird. 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 Okay. All is quiet. In addition to still being alive, Zega has somehow recruited Marie to his side. If you've been listening to his tapes, you'll know that that probably took him a couple of attempts. And not only that, but the two of them are clearly planning something. And not only that, but Zega claims to have recruited even more Prizrak and that they're ready to turn on his command. And here's the shitty keypad gimmick one more time. This thing can probably defeat Sam Fisher, but it's absolutely no match for Dr. Peretz's atrocious OPSEC. Anyway, even if you account for how none of this is really real and Zega probably did not literally burst hand first out of a literal grave, that was a lot of things that we just learned. Welcome to the third and final offshoot area of the graveyard, the maze. If you're anything like me, that title probably brings out an instinctive apprehension in you. From your map of the maze, I can clearly discern there are four valves the girl is required to turn. Each valve she releases will help to control the level of water that's flooded the hole. Once she has done this, then head to the station, reset the pump, and I'll take a vacation. It is, though, as I said, mercifully, the final area. There are, however, a few procrastinations available. If we could store, say, geo information over a broad set uh, of the Earth, and then just store it, archive it, until something really good or really bad has occurred to occur to that... One thing that I have not been able to find out about this DNA storage lock is how fast they can write it. I will fit through that. Obviously it has great promise when it comes to capacity, I mean we can store literally everything apparently, but we're still going to have some trouble if we produce data faster than we can archive it. That must be how the smelly man got to the surface. Anyway, there's a Zega room up here. And you may have noticed, we didn't even need to burn a screwdriver to get in. That's because there are no screwdrivers. Hello? stinks in here. This is everything. This is... I'm not completely sure what Wheat was reading from here. I certainly couldn't find the comments about revolutions beginning underground in the manifesto. Maybe it was something else. Loyalist, huh? Oh, yes, sir. Don't worry. He doesn't leave until everyone gets their copy signed. Who, who doesn't? <laughs> That's pretty good. Pretty good. Come on. You got your manifesto with you, right? Actually, I... Uh... Forward. Hello, prisoner. Who am I making this out to? Scarborough? Here you are. Watch your step. Darringer. All right, that's it. No more autographs for the day. Sorry, loyalist. Guess I lied. That's all right. 
Somehow I'll get over it. Hey, whoa. Come back here. Listen up. I'm having a new chair delivered tomorrow. I need you to put it together for me in my office. Can you do that? Yeah. You bet. Back in episode 3, Cooper wondered aloud how Zega managed to get Derringer's entire chair through an air vent. Turns out he didn't. It was disassembled at the time. Then again though, that chair didn't exactly look like it could disassemble completely enough to fit through a vent. On the other hand, that chair also had three legs, so maybe it was simply not a tryout for 3D asset design. dialogue in this game is often fragmentary by nature, but I can't shake the feeling that even by that standard, that last conversation was a little incomplete. It ended on a note that mm, plausibly implied that Wheat might have been about to talk Zega into letting him stay, but based on what we know for context, we can be pretty certain that he did not stay. Oh well. Let's explore the maze. Ugh. The maze is... well, it's a maze. It's not exactly the labyrinth of Knossos, but it's just complex enough to be irritating. The mammoth can not fit through these. It does have a monster though. Mammoth will show up when we turn the first valve, and will proceed to annoy us incredibly for the duration of our time here. This episode, we heard the headmaster describe Directive 95 as involving breaking mirrors, so the meaning of that is pretty clear at this point. What's less clear is exactly what's precipitated a Martian Peretz's panic. Time to spin the wheel. We know that Wheat drowned, and that was unexpected and didn't go over well, but is that why they're carrying out 95? Anyway, there goes Mammoth. Fun fact, he can walk through walls. Admittedly not all walls, only certain walls, but we can't see which walls they are. All we know is that they aren't the walls that we can crawl through, so that's something. All told, this encounter is rather tense. Mammoth is even more of an omnipresent threat than he usually is. Cheating. He's always nearby, somewhere, but even with a good set of surround sound headphones it's almost impossible to keep track of where he is. Also notable, it's also quite difficult to keep track of where you are, even with a map. 
On top of that, our objective is exploratory in nature, and our tendency as a player is to be a completionist. Add all of that up, and you have a pretty effective recipe for a survival horror mood. I'll pick this up. I don't like episode 4 very much overall, and I'm definitely not alone in that judgement. But in retrospect, I think that a lot of quite good work went into this set piece. The kind of mundane, invisible work that often gets forgotten about when players don't like the totality of something. The layout of the maze, mammoth patrol routes, shortcuts, boring stuff. Turn, 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 turn. Boring, but important. And in this case, I think, well done. I think designing a maze-like space in which one player can play cat and mouse with a symmetrically capable adversary is a deceptively complicated task. Especially if you're going to be irritating and insist that the result is good, and engaging enough and threatening enough to feel dynamic and active and challenging, but also not completely broken and impossible and frustrating. Time to spin the wheel. It is not an enviable task to have to make the player fail exactly the right number of times. But in my humble estimation, this part of this game just about manages it. I want you to stay calm. I'm going to show you something, but I want you to stay calm and do not react with the cameras. What is that above? A ball stop. Put that down. Do not be afraid, Don. There is plenty here. The toxin works quickly. There would be almost no pain. This is what you have in mind? I thought you said you could never bear another broken mirror. It is not for them. No. A ball, no. It is against my religion. Mine too. But I will not kill another to ensure my freedom. And I will not kill myself to achieve the same purpose. <sighs> We are at an impasse. It would appear so. As a scientist, I refuse to accept that. Think with me. There is no high road here. There are only two low roads. Then we dig a tunnel. Idly, I wonder if this maze isn't also intended to be a metaphor for a Martian Peretz feeling trapped with a monster of partially their own making. I've never claimed to be a very broadly experienced consumer of survival horror games. Maybe that's just a failure of my perspective. Maybe if I only knew how, I could easily immerse myself in a vast ocean of experiences better crafted than this one. I don't know. All I know is, being here, playing this, I'm inclined to defend it. I also know this. There is one aspect, one arguably characteristic survival horror experience, that this set piece has proven particularly capable at evoking. And that's striking just when you're starting to feel safe. It's like I'm steering a ship. I won't lie. I was hoping to record a perfect run through of this. She's broken. Now deep six the body. At the time, I was pretty annoyed at getting caught there. In retrospect, though, I'm pretty happy at being able to get such a perfect failure on tape. I even made sure to check with OmniView and look around for Mammoth before committing to turning the valve, but nope. He still manages to walk up and just casually punch open the face again. How does he do that? Does he actually cheat? I don't know. Game designers love making players think that the game is cheating when in fact it's playing fair. Players have proven to be almost legendarily inept at judging the sportsmanship of their AI opponents. Players are full of stories about how the opponents and your average shooter are often as smart as bricks. But it's turned out that when they're designed to play with anything resembling actual effective tactics, players become convinced that they're cheating. One of the smelly man's tapes. 
You can probably recite most of these objections reflexively by now. They teleported behind me. They never need to reload. They magically know where I am. They never seem to miss. By now though, we know the truth. That when games cheat, more often than not, they're actually handicapping themselves. It's not stealing if nobody wants it. Right? Decades of focus testing have taught a harsh lesson. There is a vast difference between a game being fair and a game feeling fair. Imagine very inexpensive biological cameras that could encode it into DNA and you could uh, and have uh, very exhaustive uh, archives of this that would only infrequently be accessed. See, and there's the DNA write speed problem again. I think that was an example of what we euphemistically call blue sky thinking. though is why exactly Amash was conflating the word tunnel with moat. Something's up there. It is working! The pump is reset. Your work here is finished. By now I would trust that the water's diminished. Return to the tunnel so the girl may escape. As always, look out for that monstrous ape. And now all we have to do is get the hell out of here. All told, I think I liked this section a lot more than perhaps I was expecting to. I think, all told, weighted against its own standards, as a disconnected thing that you have to do in a video game, this set piece just about succeeds. This is Quinn Derringer, Chief of Prayers Rack. I tried, real hard, to perfectly time these Omniview interludes around Derringer's speech, but well, I only got one shot at recording this. Who exactly is in charge up there? Dr. Amash? Dr. Barretts! Someone has drained the cooling pool around Terminus. I don't know how this went down, but it couldn't have been an accident. It was sabotage. There's no way one of your mirrors did it. And I'll bet my life it wasn't that big lummox who argues with himself. us right back to addressing what is arguably episode 4's central tension. It's difficult to know exactly how real any of this really is. Like that call from Derringer just now, it gives the impression of being live at 4 going on 5 in the morning on whatever the hell day this is, but I think it's actually a recording from when we tried to escape and then, well, by now we know how that went. Anyway, the pump room contained the last of the collectibles we need, which makes this the home stretch. And yes, as usual, it's not counting any of the Zeka tapes because I haven't actually technically listened to them yet, but I've still got them. I've got them all. Look, here they are. I got them. Everything's good. Now 
Mammoth shows up one more time to annoy us in the final stretch, but his patrol route here, starting in front of right where we're going, makes him pretty much a non-issue. This is the point of no return, so let's go and examine our media collection one last time. The Bhagavad Gita, a spiritual liberation straight-jacketed into an allegory of war, helped nurture Mahatma Gandhi, a man remembered best for peace. But his peace led only to assassination. We should beware of falling prey to his logical end. The Overseer understands the accidental power of language to sculpt a worldview. He governs the lines of communication to ensure that wasteful allegories do not confuse the Mannings and Snowdens of our age into thinking that their wars cultivate anyone's peace. I guess it was only a matter of time before Treglazov tried deploying the look what you made me do objection to having either a conscience or a backbone. This book will cut you. The Book of Revelation comes off as magical, yet is mere political subterfuge hidden beneath coded imagery. It convinces each Christian generation that they will be the last to endure suffering on earth, and the first lifted into the mystery of God. This one's a survivor. No amount of historical research can deflate those swollen with its lovely lies. The appearance of intricate mystery is an absolute threat to the Republic. Whether it is Revelation, Oracle Doors, or the lids of the Saborium and Luna, anything that grants an aura of power beyond the Overseer's final hand must be despoiled and shown in light of its shriveled power to bear truth. Leave it to Treglazov to come this close to having an actual substantive moral objection to the content of scripture, only to forget what he was talking about at the last minute and faceplant into the very dogma he started from. There are ways to object to this stuff without becoming a Reddit atheist, but this ain't it. The Torah's five books of Moses are a crossroads where the three great monotheisms meet. It is appropriate, then, that historical research suggests that Moses himself was a composite figure, one to whom the myths of many leaders have stuck. We need markers, names for the non-human. We call gravity Newton, relativity Einstein, and the leaders of Israel, Moses. The weak need symbols to fumble through their lives. The Overseer must differentiate signal from sign, must know that Moses is one man made of many. He is responsible for protecting those weak in spirit from their own lust for cult. Don't get me wrong, the discussion surrounding ancient history is fascinating. Not least because it involves the idea that we can know anything in detail about figures from the 13th century BC. That's all great, I'd love to talk more about this sometime. But, uh, I don't think it would be as entertaining as Treglazov telling us some more about the weak spirited and their lust for cult. I will fit through that. Alright. In one sense or another, it's time to escape. Well, shit. I imagine that that's exactly what happened to Weep. Which reminds me, I wonder what happened to the real mammoth, or to a Mash and Barrettes. 
Well then, old friend, it's the end of the line. This evening for me was simply divine. Despite the bad luck and inclement weather, I'd say we certainly worked well together. But all things must pass before they conclude. Even death is not more than a brief interlude. This moment has happened before, I am sure, for reincarnation is mortality's cure. Go now, old friend, by the light of the moon. I am sorry to see you leaving so soon. Goodbye, data broker. I appreciate your rhymes. Yes, good morning indeed, Conrad. Uh, there's a broken mirror in the East Passageway. Someone needs to sweep it up. Of course, sir. I'll see to it. Here at the end, I feel compelled to remake the point that I opened this episode with. Episode 4's biggest problems that soured its taste in the mouths of players and critics alike were timing and context. The first three episodes were released within a year of each other, and tell a pretty continuous and easily understandable story. More than a year passed between episodes 3 and 4. Four months of that time were spent porting the game to Windows. PC gamers were able to buy a bundle containing the first three episodes, which they could then play, all at once. And then wait. For nearly a year. And after all that time, episode 4 drops, and it's... well, it's this. I know why they did it, it makes total sense. It gave us a nice tonal change of pace as well as a chance to see some events happening outside of Metamorphosis proper. It also, notably, managed to be a possible survival horror experience. And when you play all five episodes back to back, this experience comes through. But when you really ruthlessly dissect it, it is, narratively, just kind of filler. It doesn't advance the capital P plot, although it does offer you some perspective on some matters that are adjacent to it. It has a jarring tonal shift that kind of disconnects it from Hope's story. And there's all of these pesky concerns about whether or not any of it is real. Having a tonal and narrative break between the penultimate and ultimate episodes of the story is something you can really only get away with if you're releasing all of the episodes at the same time. See Phoenix Wright for a pretty good example of how to get away with this. Republic and its release schedule, I think, played with fire there and got burned. And I think that's a shame. I'm not going to pretend it doesn't have problems. It's a bit mechanically clunky in a lot of places, some of the collectibles are a bit silly to find. But that's true of the other four episodes as well. 
And hey, if after all that, you still find my hot take unconvincing, there's always episode 5. 